are so glad that you guys are here. So last week we took a little break from our series, uh, sermon series on lessons of the wilderness uh, to celebrate um, with our youth and our kids for family worship. And did you guys have a great time last Sunday? Encouraged about that? Yeah. I am so grateful to, to Zach and Leanne for just their dedication and love uh, for our students. You know, a lot of people say that they are the church of the future and I don't like hearing that because I don't think they are the future. I think they are the now. They are as significant as you and I here. And they have people that they share with, people to love, people to cry with, people to tell Jesus about. And I, I know that their testimonies, even to the youngest, show the amazing love of Christ. Amen. Amen. Our story today is... I'll start with this, is a sensitive one. It deals with, with topics that, that some, even here, may be going through. This wilderness series, we've had a lot of people come and say, thank you for sharing openly and honestly, even at times of wilderness where it can be stressful, where answers are not easily found, and sometimes not found at all. And yet we recognize that God allowed the moment in life for us to go through this wilderness experience because he wants to prove that he, how much he loves us, how much he cares about us, and how much he wants to grow us and mature us. Uh, the story of Hagar and her wilderness story actually is multiple stories is quite interesting. And it's going to be difficult for us to actually understand Hagar's story, her wilderness story, without talking about the characters also involved in her life. You know, two weeks ago, Pastor Wayne urged us to check our obedience with God. And even though when the outcome seems uncertain, we need to be able to come to him. And he left us this question. He said, Pastor Wayne said, where is God calling you to be obedient? I think we can agree with this. Obedience is the last, or should, I should say, one of the first things to go when one is in a wilderness story. When you're in a wilderness story, you just want to get out as fast as you can, right? We just want to move on. No one has fun being in a wilderness. Though I can say that some of us within our wilderness story has begun decorating our wilderness if your wilderness is a cave, there will be strobe lights. Are you all with me? If, it, if it's a long journey in a car, the music will be cracking and, and you will be singing along and dancing along. Somehow there's a way for us to do that. Well, this wilderness story that we're going to talk about today uh, didn't have those. Didn't even have the opportunities to have those. Our lesson today takes us from Genesis 16 all the way to Genesis 21. So I hope you had good breakfast this morning because buckle up. <laughs> I might skip a verse or two talking about uh, uh, these stories. But, you know, I, I want you to take notes. And I want you to promise me that after today's sermon, you will go back and read these chapters. They're so beautiful. And they're so exciting. Folks, if, if you like drama, this is it. All right, I, I'm one of those that avoid Lifetime Television or the Hallmark Channel or any of that stuff just because I can't do it. But I like rom-coms, though. I like romantic comedies. But this is definitely not one of those. These are serious topics that, that is happening in this history lesson of Genesis 16 to 21. Uh, we start with Abram. We get to know him as Abraham, as we popularly know him. Because God changed his name. We talk about also his wife, Sarai, or Sarai. She becomes Sarah as God renames her. So if I go back and forth with the two names, please forgive me, all right? Is this a matter of when they were called their previous name or their new names? So God comes to Abram and said, you know, even though you are old, 75 years old, I, I want you to go follow me. I want you to leave what you know, pack up your wife and everything that you have, because I'm going to take you to a better place, a promised land. 
And God promised him many descendants. But there's a problem. God promised Abraham protection and countless descendants, but Sarah, his wife, is barren. And she cannot be with child. And she grappled with this personal disappointment because there's huge cultural pressure during that time. That her role and expectations for her is that she would be able to provide a child for her husband and develop a family. So Sarai offers a solution. Desperate for an heir, Sarai proposes that, you know what? I have a plan. And this is where we jump on Genesis chapter 16, beginning from verse 1. Now Sarai, Abraham's wife, Abram's wife, had not been able to bear children for him, but she had an Egyptian servant named Hagar. So Sarai and Abram said to Abram, The Lord has prevented me from having children. Go and sleep with my servant. Perhaps I can have children through her. And Abram agreed with Sarai's proposal. See, the proposal actually was not something, um, you know, where did that come from? Or that is so weird. At that time, this is actually common practice during that culture. And it was expected of Sarai, because she cannot bear a child, to offer her servant, her slave, to her husband to be second wife. It's not about Sarai seeking you know, just her own version of a human solution. I, I want you to hear that well. God made a promise. She took it upon herself to follow through or to do that promise, to be the one to claim the promise for herself and not wait for God. I want you to hear that. But I want us to understand also that Abraham is not excused from this. He is much involved in the decision as Sarai was. Are y'all with me? I mean, Timothy Keller, when I was um, reading more about this, I like how he explains it. He said, Abraham had two women in front of him, and Abraham wanted a family. Before this moment, Abraham listened to the Lord when the Lord called him and made the promise to him, and he said, I, he will follow. But at that moment, when Sarai gave this proposal to Abraham, Abraham did not listen to God. He listened to Sarai. He listened to the human solution. Keller also added that Abraham deciding on the situation, he had a choice. If Abraham was to have a family through Sarai, then he would have to rely on God's divine supernatural power. That was the choice, right? If I'm going to trust on God's promises then I would have to rely on his supernatural grace. But that's not what occurred, right? And if Abraham was to have a family with Hagar, then he's trusting in his own ability, in his own human ability. So Abraham had a choice right there to save himself by grace or to save himself through works. To rely on his own ability or to rely on God's provision for his supernatural grace, for God's promises to go through. Are you tracking with me? How does it work with us? Well, believe it or not, all the way in Galatians, Paul talks about this. Galatians 4, 21 to 23. Tell me, you who want to live under the law, do you know what the law actually says? All right, let me paraphrase that a little bit. Hey, Christians, Christ followers, know-it-alls. Those who, of you who think you can figure this out on your own. That's my paraphrase. All right. Verse 22. The scriptures say, say that Abraham had two sons. One from his slave wife and one from the freeborn wife. The son of the slave wife was born in a human attempt to bring about the fulfillment of God's promise. But the son of the freeborn wife was born as God's own fulfillment of his promise. So even Paul makes it clear, doesn't he? That there was a choice. God fulfilled promise or human effort fulfilled promise. Are you all with me? If the world feels overwhelming, 
And for some of us, it might be overwhelming right now. That's what it means, by the way, to be in a wilderness. When you feel that you've lost control. When you feel that everything is overwhelming, it might be time to let God fulfill his promise. Rather than you fulfilling the promises for him. It might be the time to stop. It's like building a bridge. Working hard on building a bridge to get to the promise. But the promise is already there. No bridge has to be built. Remember, don't rush the wilderness process. Because God's promise is always available. Here's the beautiful part. God does not need our help to fulfill his promise. Think about that for a second. Let let it sink in. He's not waiting for you or I to figure it out. When he makes a promise, he doesn't say, here's a promise I have for you. Good luck. It's, it's, it's not a wish. It's something that when he promises it, it's going to happen. Make sense? It's not a human kind of promise that can be taken back. He delights in surprising you and I. And that's what's awesome about his promise. He delights in exceeding the expectations and working in so unfathomable, unthinkable ways. You know that it's him. You begin to recognize that. You know what's messed up when it's us who's following through the promises? Then it becomes our works. Then who becomes the victor in that way? Me, 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 me. God, I'm going to make your promises happen. Do you hear the pride in that? This is something that you and I need to think about seriously. Because if that's the case, if we remember that it's not about works and about his faithfulness, we can take a deep breath. We can release everything to the Lord. And let God be the keeper of his promise. If there's anything I want us to come up with from this message today, is I want us to know that. I want us to go home to know that God keeps his promises. Let's continue reading Genesis 16, 4 through 6. So Abraham had sexual relations with Hagar, and she became pregnant. But when Hagar knew she was pregnant, she began to treat her mistress, Sarai, with contempt. Stop there for a second. It was her idea, <laughs> right? But now she, there's jealousy there. Verse 5, then Sarai said to Abraham, this is all your fault. <laughs> Remember Adam and Eve, <laughs> right? It's all your fault. I put my servant into your arms, but now that she's pregnant, she treats me with contempt. The Lord will show who's wrong, you or me. So Abraham replied, look, she's your servant, dear. You deal with her. (laughs) So deal with her as you see fit. And then Sarai treated Hagar so harshly that she finally ran away. Now, before we move forward, I I don't want us to be thrown off with the concept of polygamy here. It's, It's, you know, the Bible talks about monogamy as God's plan. The Bible consistently presents monogamy as the way God wants marriage to be. Throughout the Bible, there are instances of having children outside marriage often, and it leads to complications such as jealousy, rivalry, and definitely distress. And disaster, unfortunately, follows Hagar when she conceived, and the tension escalates, as we see in this story. Now, there's a blame game, right, happening between Abraham and Sarai. Now, it becomes a fight between Abraham and Sarai on whose fault it is when Sarai said, the Lord will show who's wrong, you or me. You know what she's actually saying is, <laughs> I'm furious and I have a right to be. I'm so angry with this. I'm so angry. It's not working out the way I wanted it to be. See, the culture provides this way. If Hagar was to give birth to a child, that child becomes automatically Sarai's. It's an immediate transaction. That was the expectation. But yet still, there's anger in her. 
And then Sarai treated Hagar so harshly that she finally ran away. And here begins another wilderness journey for Hagar. I said another because I want us to hear. I want us to read between the lines. It tells us that she was an Egyptian slave. Abraham and Sarai are not Egyptian. So she was a foreigner taken into slavery from a distant land and now traveling with her masters. Do you guys see this? She has had many, many wilderness stories. Can you just imagine what she's been through already? The trigger. For Sarai, it's because Hagar, I mean, for Hagar, Sarai treated Hagar so harshly that Hagar finally ran away, Genesis 16, 6. And then uh, the trigger for Sarai, though, is that when Hagar knew she was pregnant, she began to treat her Mr. Sarai with contempt. So that tells us something about this situation also. It tells us that Hagar, in addition to being a, a foreign slave, also found herself her own worth in what the culture defines. To have children. Remember, Sarai had the same problem. They were trying to meet the expectations of the culture. They're trying to meet the expectations of what the world had for him. So if you are here, you might be thinking, Dennis, this is so wrong. Today's lesson might have you fired up with emotions. Ladies, you you, you might feel, golly, to be defined as just a childbearer? And my sole job is just to provide a family for her husband? I, I, I want us to hold on here for a second. I want us to think of it this way. Whether modern, whether old, I want you to know that expectations are real. The expectations to the modern woman today is what? To be the second family provider. What's the expectation of women today? To be able to be independent. Men, we're not excused either. What's the expectation on us? To be in such a good life that we can provide. That we can provide security and safety and hopefully leave a legacy. Are you all with me? Whether old, whether new, expectations should not define us. The expectation of the world, the expectation of the community, the expectation of the old or the now should not be the one defining us. Because that moment that happens, then you and I no longer have control of the life that God wants us to live. It's no longer seeking what the Holy Spirit wants from us. It's now following what the expectation of the world. But Dennis, there's nothing wrong with these expectations. Absolutely not, folks. Idols do not need to look so good for you to think that they are idols. Are y'all with me? It doesn't, idols don't necessarily have horns and tails and look like the devil. Idols are anything that define us outside God's plan for us. And culture can do that, can't it? We should be defined by God. Regardless of what we, the world tells you to pursue, regardless of the cultural norms, whether old or new, they should not define you. Let God define you. Your identity is rooted, should be rooted solely on Jesus. We are redeemed. We are forgiven through Jesus. Our past mistakes should no longer define us. The expectations, whether met or not met, should no longer define us. Our works should not define us. You know what defines us? Only His grace does. And that's transformative, isn't it? That changes everything. Back to the story, Genesis 16, verse 7. The angel of the Lord, Hagar left. The angel of the Lord found Hagar beside a spring of water in the wilderness along the road of Tushur. The angel said to her, Hagar? Sarai's servant, where have you come from? And where are you going? The Lord found Hagar. I I want us to see this. Know that it was the Lord who sought after Hagar and not the other way around. Also note that the angel started with a question rather than jumping to instruction. 
this teaches us many lessons on how to walk with someone who may be going through their wilderness. Do not wait for them to seek you. Go out and search for them. Many of us are in the wilderness. And by the way, some people ask me this, Dennis, can you be in wilderness and be able to walk with someone who also is in their wilderness? The last time I checked, that's the best way to look at it. If you're struggling with something, with something, and you're trusting on the Lord, find somebody else who's struggling, struggling with that same something or similar something, and take them along. Then you can pray with them and be with them and truly have empathy with each other. Right? And do not wait for them to see you go out and search for them. Do not be quick to provide a solution. Start by simply being there. Present. Available. Caring by asking questions rather than giving the answers or giving instructions. Have you heard someone before like they come to you and go, hey, I, I need you to pray for me. Well, I have a solution. It's like, what? When someone comes to you and says, I'm in a wilderness experience and I need you to be there for me. The answer is the quick. The answer is not, well, let me give you a list of to-dos. You know why that's not the case? Because even God, through his angel, did not work that way. He did not. And note that this discussion between Agar and the angel wasn't about whose fault it was or how she got there. Can you see how that was missing in the conversation? When we're working or walking in wilderness with someone, if you are walking in the wilderness, when God sees you, it's not about a conversation of whose fault it is, nor a conversation of how you got there. It's a conversation about care, about being present, about providing. Remember, we don't have to understand everything while in the wilderness. And we got to remember that God provides himself. While God may not always provide the answers to our questions that we may have, he always provides himself. Instead of focusing on the unanswered questions, we can shift our attention to God's faithfulness, to God's faithfulness, his comfort, and his promise to work all things good together for those who love him. By the way, that's what the passage means, not the other things. We don't command God. Genesis 16, 9 through 10, the angel of the Lord said to Hagar, return to your mistress and submit to her authority. Wait, what? <laughs> Then he added, I will give you more descendants than you can count. This is insane. I'm sorry. <laughs> when I read this, I had to stop also. And every time I read it, I still get struck by, by that thought. But we got to remember what it says, Isaiah 58, 8 or 9. My thoughts are not like your thoughts, says the Lord. And my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so many ways, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. His higher ways must be the one that's followed, not our lower ways. But we need to come ourselves to that humility, that his ways are higher than ours. Listening? Are you guys tracking with me here? His ways are higher than ours. Do we trust the voice of God or do we trust our own voice, our own advice? We will go follow him even if it does not make sense. And definitely it does not make sense in this situation. Because the Lord knew his promise for Hagar is to go where she does not want to go. As the story continues, verse 11, and the angel also said, you are now pregnant. And will give birth to a son. And you are named to name him Ishmael, which means God hears. For the Lord has heard your cry of distress. Pay attention to what it did not say. It did not say the Lord has heard your well-worded prayers. It did not say the Lord has admired her courage. It did not say that the Lord's watches the ability to work it out on her own. It was not about that. 
It says, for the Lord has heard your cry of distress. I love reading that. I love focusing on that because this shows us again how much God loves beyond what man can do or say. God shows compassion not because we are deserving, but simply because he is loving. God cares for the one who cries in, the, in their distress. God hears our distress and he shows up. Genesis 16, 12. This son of yours will be a wild man, as untamed as a wild donkey. He will raise his fist against everyone, and everyone will be against him. Yes, he will live in hope and hostility against all his relatives. Notice that the angel did not cover or did not soften what Hagar's child is going to go through. But verse 13, hear this. Thereafter, Hagar used another name to refer to the Lord who had spoken to her. She said, you are the God who sees me, Elroy. She also said, have I truly seen the one who sees me? Hagar said, you are the God who sees me. Hagar realized that God sees everything, including her. And sometimes we, we get trapped on this because we feel that it's about the situation you're in. Yes, God sees the situation. But you know who he sees within the situation? He sees you. Can you imagine the difference that would make for us to recognize that? He knows the situation. He knows how it's even going to play out. But it's not about that. He's focused more on the you within the situation. That's how much, how much he loves you. The big idea. Hagar's wilderness story highlights God's care in times of distress and desperation. We're always seen by El Roy, our God who sees. This was a turning point when Hagar no longer feared returning home. Returning to Sarai, returning to Abraham, returning to the culture that she left behind. Remember that she is going back to slavery. Hear that in the story. She's choosing to go back to slavery. Dennis, that's insane. Why would God allow that? Genesis 16, 14 to 16. So that well was named where she was, Bir Lahai Roy, which means well of the living one who sees me. It can still be found there, according to scripture, between Kadesh and Bered. So Hagar gave, gave Abra, um, Abram a son. And Abram named him Ishmael. Abram at this time was 86 years old when Ishmael was born. See, I, I, I wish that the story ends there. It's nice. <laughs> it's good. We're done. But it, there's more. Let's jump a few verses, okay? Let's go to Genesis chapter 17. Genesis 17, beginning from verse 15. At this time, God said to Abram, Regarding Sarai, your wife, her name will no longer be Sarai. From now on, her name will be Sarah. And I will bless her and give you a son from her. Wait, what? <laughs> yes, I will bless her richly and she will become the mother of many nations. King of nations. Kings of nations will be among her descendants. You got to remember, Abraham at this time go, I already have Ishmael. We're good. We're good. I have this young man. And I have two wives. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I mean, you need to understand Abraham's position when he hears this. You need to put yourself in that. But God replied, verse 19, No, Sarah, your wife, will give birth to a son for you, and you will name him Isaac. And I will confirm my covenant with him and his descendants as an everlasting covenant. As for Ishmael, I will bless him also, just as you have asked. And I will make him extremely fruitful and multiply uh, his descendants. He will become the father of 12 princes, and I will make him into a great nation. But my covenant will be confirmed with Isaac, who will be born to you and Sarah about this time next year. When God had finished speaking, he left Abraham. I tell you, this is a juicy story. <laughs> Seriously, I'm like... 
I, I, when I'm looking at this story, hearing about this story, so I mean, I cannot. I, I really don't like drama, dramatic movies that make me cry. I don't understand why we have to pay money to make someone to make you cry, but people do that. <laughs> Despite Abraham and Sarai attempting to fulfill God's promise for God, God was still faithful to act for the promises he made to Abraham. So even though they messed up and, and did not trust on, on God's provision, God's faithfulness, perfect timing, and love is shown right here. Despite their old age, God assures Abraham and Sarah a son. And God promises to bless both Isaac and Ishmael. God's covenant would stand regardless of how Abraham or Sarah or Hagar. Regardless of how they act. See, there's a big lesson here for us. We like to think that we control God. We like to think that we're the ones in control of history. Folks, I don't know about you. That's frustrating. We don't. He does. The question is, do we trust his story? His version of how it's supposed to play out. The Lord fulfilled his promise to Sarah and to Abraham. Gen Genesis 21, 1 through 7, the Lord kept his word and did, and did for Sarah exactly what he had promised. She became pregnant and she gave birth to a son for Abraham in his old age. This happened at just the time God said it would. And Abraham named their son Isaac. Eight days after Isaac was born, Abraham circumcised him as God has commanded. Check this out. Verse 5, Abraham was how many years old? You know, God blessed me with an Emily Ann <laughs> later in life, but I cannot just imagine having a baby at 100 years old. <laughs> Abraham was 100 years old when Isaac was born. Verse 6, and Sarah declared, God has brought me laughter. All who hear about this will laugh with me. Who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse a baby? Yet I have been given Abraham, I have given Abraham a son in his old age. Uh, the Lord fulfills his promises. God's plan often surprises and surpasses our expectations and human predictions. Then we know it's from him. This is how we know it is from God. From having or from being Sarai who was distraught, she is now Sarah who had the joy of laughter. This is what God brings when we trust on his promises and his perfect timing. Again, I wish the story ends there. It's nice. It does not. This is crazy. This should be like multiple movies, you know, you know what I'm saying? It's a trilogy. In Genesis 21, verses 8 to 14, we jump there. When Isaac grew up and was about to be weaned, Abraham prepared a huge feast to celebrate the occasion. Verse 9, but Sarah saw Ishmael, the son of Abraham and her Egyptian servant Hagar, making fun of their son Isaac. Dun, dun, dun. So she turned to Abraham and demanded, hey, get rid of that slave woman and her son. He is not going to share the inheritance with my son Isaac. I won't have it. This upset Abraham very much because Ishmael was his son. But God told Abraham, do not be upset over the boy and your servant. Do whatever Sarah tells you. For Isaac is the son through whom your descendants will be counted. But I will also make a nation of the descendants of Hagar's son, because he is your son too. So Abraham got up early the next morning, prepared food and a container of water, and strapped them on Hagar's shoulders. Man, he could have given her an animal or something, golly. Then she sent her away with their son, and she wandered aimlessly in the wilderness of Beersheba. How many wilderness stories does Hagar have to go through?
When the water was gone, verse 18, I'm sorry, verse 15. When the water was gone, she put the boy in the shade of a bush. And then she went and sat down by herself about 100 yards away. I don't want to watch the boy die, she said. As she burst into tears. Verse 17. But God heard the boy crying. And the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven. Hagar, what's wrong? Do not be afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Go to him. Comfort him. For I will make a great nation from his descendants. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Again, it was so like when Hagar was pregnant with the same boy that she is with right now. God hears the crying. Say it with me. God hears me when I cry. Say it again. What difference does that make for you to believe that? The angel starts with a question. And not immediate instruction again. The angel comforts and says, do not be afraid. And then provides instructions with a promise. For I will make a great nation from his descendants. In Genesis 21, 19. And then God opened Hagar's eyes. And she saw a well full of water. She quickly filled her water container and gave the boy a drink. When Hagar thought that it was over for her son, God heard her cry, opened her eyes, and she sees a well and reassured her again of the promise. God shown his presence and care even in desperate situations, and God will do it again and again and again and again. Genesis 21, 20, and God was with the boy as he grew up in the wilderness. He became a skillful, skillful archer. And he settled in the wilderness of Paran. His mother arranged for him to marry a woman from the land of Egypt. So in chapter 16, pregnant Hagar flees from Sarah due to her harsh treatment. In chapter 21, Sarah asked Abraham to send, Sarah, to send Hagar and Ishmael away for making fun of her son Isaac. Twice, Hagar finds herself in the most desperate of situations. Yet in both her wilderness experiences, God showed up. Do you know that God does not get tired of you? Do you know that? He doesn't. Do you know that God doesn't get tired of your situation? Or your multiple situations? Or the craziness that you feel you're in? He doesn't. You may be here thinking today, I, I, I don't feel that God sees me. Nor that God hears my cry. Nor God understand my pain. And know this, remember his promises. He is God El Roy, the God who sees. And you are to ask, have I truly seen the one who sees me? That's what Agar asked afterwards. Not only does she recognize that God sees her. She wanted to know, can I see God? That's a question that we should be asking ourselves. Do you see God in your wilderness? When was the last time you cried out to God? For some of us, it might just be minutes ago. Last night. When was the last time you knew, you believe that God actually sees you? through your despair, through your situation, not just the situation, He sees you. How does knowing that God sees you provide you comfort? Folks, being in wilderness is tiring, but I want you to know this. He is with you in a stuff and as crazy as the situations happening around you, know that you can take rest in Him and His promises. It's okay to cry. 
It's okay to say, I need a break. It's okay to take rest upon him. But we need to ask ourselves this question. Have I truly seen the one who sees me? Let's pray. Dear Lord, we don't want to pretend that everything is perfect when we know it's not. We want to be honest. Despite of everything, we know that you are good. Even when we cannot comprehend the reasons behind our wilderness, we acknowledge that we don't need all the answers for us to move on. We recognize that your wisdom and, our, and, and understanding surpasses ours. We remember that regardless of where we are or where we've been, we recognize that you see us and care for us. You offer us comfort and provision. And you offer this to anyone who cries out. And you will always fulfill your promise as you did to Hagar again and again and again. And today some of us may feel unseen, unheard, and in pain. We want to remind ourselves that you are El Roy, the God who sees. And we ask ourselves, have we truly seen the one who sees us? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.